Welcome back to another session of Inside Medical Malpractice. Thank you so very much for being here. We took a short break last month to rest and recoup and catch our breath a little bit, but hey, now it's September and it's time to get back to work and play. And it's a new season for lots and lots of things. One thing we learned when we took our break a couple of weeks ago is that Inside Medical Malpractice has been named one of the top 10 healthcare related podcasts in Canada. And we're in the company of the Canadian Medical Association Journal, which is such an honor to us. And we've also been named one of the top 50 pod podcasts in healthcare and for healthcare professionals on the web, on the World Wide Web. And we're in the great company of the New England Journal of Medicine, the Merck Manual, the British Medical Journal and the American Medical Association podcast. So a great big thank you to all of you who've taken part in this, who've listened, who've encouraged, who've subscribed. And to thank you, we're going to have a contest this month in celebration of everyone who's helped us get to where we are. Um, and we're offering a 250 gift card to one lucky winner to spend at a local business of their choice. To enter this contest, please just go to Apple, subscribe to the podcast Inside Medical Malpractice, rate us, give us a review, hopefully a good one or a great one, and then send us a quick email with contest in the subject line to info at connectmlx.com. We'll choose a winner, a winner randomly at the end of the month on September 30th, and we'll notify you by email. So please enter, good luck, and thank you so much once again for listening and for helping us to get the success that we've managed so far. Now today, I'd like to welcome the first of a series of great guests that we've got up for this season. <clears throat> I heard about this guy, Randy Kennard, an attorney from the law firm of Kennard Clayton and Beverage in Nashville, Tennessee. I heard about him from a colleague who sent me an article that outlined some of Randy's amazing accomplishments. Um, he was one of the best lawyers in the U.S., one of the best lawyers in Tennessee, a super lawyer, a civil trial specialist, a medical malpractice specialist, and had just recently been invited to join the Inner Circle of Advocates, which is an invitation only legal group that recognizes the nation's top 100 plaintiff lawyers. And I gotta tell you, that's just the beginning of a very, very impressive list of awards and accolades for this guy. And so I thought I need to just meet him and see who this is and see what he has to say and bring his knowledge to all of you who I'm sure will be fascinated to hear. So I just wanna say, first of all, welcome to Randy Kennard. Chris, thank you. What a, what a nice things you said about me and I, I love your program here. And it's, it's such an impressive list of people who listen and I look forward to talking with you today. Thank you. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Before we start talking, um, I want to just tell everybody a little bit more about you so that they all know as much as I know. And then we're going to learn lots more about you as this hour progresses. Randy Kennard is a highly respected legal professional, considered one of the best lawyers in Nashville. He's been recognized by countless organizations and publications. Something that caught my attention right away that I loved about Randy um, on his website, he lists the two secrets or cornerstones of his practice as competence and respect. And for any of you who've listened to this podcast, um, those are certainly qualities that I try to embrace deep respect for the professions of law and medicine and all of the people who are ever involved in any way in issues surrounding medical malpractice. But he stands out from other lawyers, not just by his commitment to respect. He's certified, as I said, as a civil trial specialist, a medical malpractice specialist by the American Board of Professional Liability. In his 40 years of lawyering, he's recovered many record setting verdicts for malpractice and personal injury vic victims, including a $22 million jury vi victim that was the largest in the state for any single person. And we're gonna have a little chat about that case today because it's pretty fascinating on so many levels. 
Prior to pursuing law school, Randy attended West Point Academy. He served in Vietnam with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, which he says equipped him for success within his legal practice. He was awarded the Vietnam Cross of Gallantry, a Purple Heart, a Bronze Star for Valor, an Air Medal for two of his tours in Vietnam. I have a page and a half of awards and recognitions and honors that I could read to you. Um, I'll just read you the top five or six, and Dan, this is readily available on his website. <clears throat> if you look him up, you'll find all of this, but just listen to some of this. He's selected to the Inner Circle of Advocates, the International Academy of Trial Lawyers. In 2020, he was a recipient of the Pursuit of Justice Award by the American Bar Association. He was the Outstanding Trial Lawyer of the Year in Tennessee Trial Lawyers in 2016, Best Lawyers in America since 1993, Best Product Liability Lawyer in Nashville in 2019, Fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, Fellow Litigation Council of America, Top 50 Nashvilles and Lawyers, Super Lawyer 2012 to 2020. I mean, it just goes on and on, like Randy, <laughs> like, so impressive, so impressive and so beautiful to read about you. So congratulations on what so far seems to have been an incredibly successful career. I'm honored to have you here and really, truly looking forward to what you have to say for us today. Chris, uh, such nice things you said. Thank you so much. It's going to be my honor talking with you. And I hope I have some ideas that people might be able to use to do consider and it's all to be fun. It's going to be fun. And I'm 100% sure that you've got some ideas for people to use and consider and interesting to hear. I'm also already in love with your accent. I mean, you probably think I have an accent, this, us Canadians up here. But um, I, I grew up in Indiana and my dad's family is from Kentucky. So I am, I can pull out that accent in 10 seconds or less if I, if I had to. I've still got it in here. But it feels so comfortable and familiar to me to hear this beautiful Southern accent. And um, so just bring it. All right. Let's, well, Kentucky, let's hear it. Kentucky's pretty close to Tennessee, you know. So I know it is. I know it is. So let's start. Um, I've got some questions here to kind of guide us, but please feel free to take this conversation where it goes. I'd like to, first of all, when you look you up on the web, one of the first things that pops up in multiple sites is a particular case that you're quite well know, known for called the Aaron Andrews case. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? It was a huge award and seems to be a big case that got a tremendous amount of publicity. Let's hear your perspective on that. Sure. Aaron, as most people know, is a sports announcer, a sports caster. She stands on the sidelines of professional football games and knows more football, in my opinion, than the men in the booth, okay? And she calls up to them plays that are going to happen, and uh, they listen to her carefully, and she's just a big hit. Anyway, she was going to, back in the day, do a college football game in Nashville, Vanderbilt versus South Carolina. And there was a man who was – following her where she would go. He had stalked her in two other hotels before this game. But he called Marriott International and said, I'd like a room next to Aaron Andrews for the South Carolina Vanderbilt game. And they said that message never got down to the local hotel. But he ended up in the room next to Aaron Andrews. And that we considered a violation of any safe protocols. He was put in her, the room next to her. And she enters the room and he knows she's there, he's listening. And when she leaves again, he goes out in the hall and removes the peephole to her door with his fingers. Took that back to his room, drilled out the center of the peephole to make it a hollow tube, put it back in her door so she wouldn't know it had been tinkered with. 
and waited for her in his room. For her to go back to her room, she did. She took a shower. Then he goes out in the hall with his phone and the lens for the camera of his phone. He put right up to the now peephole with the hollow tube in it and captured about four and a half minutes of Aaron without clothes on. He tried to sell this video. No one would buy it. And so he decided to just post it on the internet. And there were millions of hits. By the time the case was tried, our computer expert testified that there were 16 million individual hits of this video. Aaron found out about this from a friend who called her one night and said, Aaron, did you know you're on the internet without any clothes on? And she just absolutely fell apart and called her father. And he thought he testified at trial. He thought she something, you know, she'd beaten up or some horrible thing had happened to her. She was crying. And so we sued the hotel for putting her next putting him next to her and a host of other issues that were involved, system failures, uh, failing to keep a careful lookout on the floor, things like that, no security on the floor, other problems. And the jury uh, understood in the end that putting a man next to a woman without clearing this with the woman is a bad mistake and needs to never happen again. The verdict was a significant verdict, $55 million. And that verdict was loud enough to send a message to the hotel industry. Don't do that. And now when you check in to a hotel, they will not call your room number out loud. They're writing on a card, right? Yeah. And, and nobody, around can hear what room you're going to get. Nobody sees it. And, and they will not put somebody next to you, whether you're a man or a woman, unless they call you and say, is it okay for us to put this person next to you? Interestingly, we uh, argued that the way the jury should assess the damages is, well, you've heard 16 million hits. And let's just call it four and a half dollars per hit. And that would have been 75 million, but they sort of mitigated and said 55. But the, the word went out about this case. It's in hotel magazines and everything about what happened. And Aaron did a fantastic job of carrying through with this. It was a lot of pressure. It was huge pressure on her throughout the trial. And our team, uh, Bruce Brolett in California, and our team was so happy for her that she got these changes made. And what a great individual. Anyway, but that's, that's that case. Mm -hmm. That's a fascinating case. So the, I just want to ask you, I mean, first of all, it's a terrible thing to have happened. Um, I'm glad that a case like this affected positive change, particularly and safety for women and privacy issues. Um, and certainly I've noticed some of the things you're talking about, how they're, how quiet they are about the room that you're in and the keys, the keys protected. And sometimes I get up to my, the floor that I'm at and I still, I don't know where my room is because I don't remember it or it's not written down anywhere, but that's a better thing. That's a better thing than announcing it to anybody at the desk. So $4 a hit, which is kind of interesting. What, um, so what were those damages for? Can you talk to me about, were they mostly punitive damages or personal pain and suffering? Or how was that $4 kind of sorted out? No punitive damages were sought. And we, we felt that the jury likely will be very angry about what happened. And sometimes when juries get angry, they... Uh, can make their voice heard better with an adequate award, one that's not inadequate. And I talked to the foreman of this jury about that later. And he said they really wanted to send a message with impact. 
So this often happens in medical cases also. Jurors can feel, oh, this just, this, we, we can't handle this now. This is not right, and we need to send the message. So the medical side of these cases needs to be aware of that potential in any case. Uh, but getting back to Erin, she had significant emotional reactions to what happened. She was so embarrassed. Naturally, she thought her career was going to be over. People were accusing her of being in on this to promote her career. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't. She spent over $100,000 trying to take this video down. She hired professionals to get rid of it if they could. And they did, they got rid of a lot of it, but the truth is you're never gonna get rid of something on the internet. And it's popped up all over the place. And the experts said, this is never gonna be gone. People will be watching this forever. So she had to, and still does bear emotional hurt anytime this comes up. And it, she often gets, heckling from uh, fans at football games mm. don't understand what happened who think she was in on it. And it's just, so it's just a huge problem for a celebrity to have. She's a great yeah. person. By the way, Erin Andrews is as pretty on the inside as she is on the out. I mean, mm. wonderful, wonderful person. She's doing well now and her career is blossomed fantastic person, uh, but it was emotional damage. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. And as so often happens, the victim somehow becomes the target, you know, the target of the perpetration somehow as so often happens. So I just want to say good luck to Erin and bless you for, for defending her and supporting her through this. And, um, I hope you affected some positive change in the world. It sounds like you did. It sounds like you did. We did. You know, when this happened, 80% of the peepholes could be unscrewed by hand and <laughs> modified and, and just all kinds of improper, negligent things were going on uh, with hotels and security and check-in procedures. And this case really changed a lot of things. And I'm proud for Erin that she did this. And I'm, I'm proud for what we did. Very happy about what we did to make some good. Mm. Yeah, congratulations. Well, let's move on to another case that um, also pops up when we put, type in Randall Kennard. This is um, a $22 million verdict. And I believe, if I'm correct, this was for Betty Donathan or Bet Donathan. Am I correct? And um, I found this really interesting because, if, first of all, let's, we're going to move into the realm of medical malpractice. And this is a malpractice case that's got some interesting angles to it, I felt. And I found it in a couple of places as in a Tennessee jury verdict report that just talks some basics about the case. But then I also found an interesting article that outlines one of your cross examinations of the expert who had been um, retained for the defendant doctor. So cross, cross examination of orthopedic surgeon. So let's talk this through a little bit on a couple of angles. Why don't you first of all, tell us a bit about the case. And then I've got some questions for you. And um, one of them being, you know, $22 million verdict, and that's in, two, in 2010, if I'm correct. So I don't know what that'd be in today's dollars, but that's a huge verdict. And that, again, was a jury verdict, a jury trial as well, correct? That's right. It was in federal court in Chattanooga. And Betty was 55 years old, and she was a passenger in her car driven by her husband and somebody crossed over the center line it was not a huge impact, but it was enough to break her tibia in her right leg. That's in the lower part of the leg. So she's admitted to a hospital in Winchester, Tennessee, a small rural town. 
to have that fixed. Now she's going to come out of that hospital paralyzed in a few days. Okay. So that would perk anybody's ears up. How in the world did that happen? And the reason it happened was medical negligence on several levels. But what happened? Why did this happen? Betty had an artificial heart valve and she had to be on a blood thinner. Somebody with anesthesia and nobody ever admitted who it was, but somebody in anesthesia comes into her room before surgery and says, Ms. Donathan, we need to put an epidural catheter in you for post-op pain control. And Betty said, I thought that was uh, for delivering babies. And they said, well, it is, but we've also learned that it's a great post-op pain control. She said, okay, and she consented. The surgery's carried out, and after surgery, the orthopedic surgeon orders this epidural catheter removed. And of course, she's back on heparin, blood thinner, due to the fact that she needs it uh, for her heart valve. But you're supposed to stop the blood thinner medicine long enough so when you pull the catheter, clotting can occur but they didn't stop the blood thinner. They just pulled it. So that's a nurse and a doctor, assuming protocol is going to be followed or was followed and somebody stopped the blood thinner, but nobody did. That was an assumption. So she starts bleeding around her spine and the hospital people on Sunday, Easter Sunday, thought she was a whiner and she starts complaining about leg pain. And they're, you know, so they're not paying much attention to her and thinking this is, we've got a whiner here. The truth is, of course, the blood is pressing on her cord. And in a few hours, the, the pressure is going to become so great. It's going to kill her cord and she's going to be paralyzed. So, we sue everybody, the surgeon, anesthesia, and the hospital. And the first thing I did was take the deposition of the surgeon, who was a very attractive 50-ish female who had come from uh, Florida, transferred up to Tennessee, and who went for doctor will uh, went to work for doctor will call him Doctor A, and I'm learning all this in the first ten minutes of her deposition. Room's full of lawyers, and I said, Doctor, I noticed on your resume uh, that you worked for Doctor A when you first came here, but only two months later, you moved to Doctor B's office. Why did you do that? And this doctor looked down at the table. Little tears came down the sides of her eyes. And I went, uh-oh. And there's this long pause. I could hear the voice of a mentor I had in law school. It was, it was a very hard man. I could hear his voice and he told me, Press her, Randy, find out why she moved. This could come in handy. And I heard that voice. <laughs> <laughs> then I heard my mother's voice, which said, don't do that, Randy. She doesn't want to talk about this. And mother won the day. And uh, I said, would you prefer not to answer this line of questioning? She said, I would rather not answer I figured, of course, that it was some sort of sexual harassment, right? Okay. I, I didn't know, but it seemed logical. Her reaction to tears and the quick move. And I said, I respect that. I'm not going to ask you any more about that. I'll move on. And she said, thank you. 
Now, this was a moment of respect, right? I respected her wish. I like to think I rose above the, the fray and respected her personally. I didn't know the benefits that this would bring my client eventually, but I'll tie that in in just a moment. And you respected your mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I love my mother and respect her. So a few minutes later, I said, uh, by the way, when you first came to this hospital, were they doing too many epidural catheters in your view? Oh, yes, she said. Really? I said, yes. And she then offered, Mr. Kennard, when I first came here, they were doing epidural catheters on my patients. I told them to stop. I went to the chief of staff. I went to everybody. I went to the hospital administration and nobody cared. And they kept doing it. I kept protesting. So we're making great progress. And uh, one of the defense lawyers says, can we take a break? And this was 30 minutes into the deposition. We go out in the hall and, and he says, so, okay, the case is over. Uh, how much do you want? Oh. Yeah. Are you crazy? We've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> We're going back in here. So we'll go back in and she faulted those that had made the decision to ignore her request. And then I, I said, did you even know that there was an epidural catheter in your patient before surgery? She said, no, I didn't. So how did you find it out? After surgery, I just happened to discover it. And that's when I said, take that thing out. Okay. Well, the human side of her, the emotional side of her had to be going. I'm so angry. They did this again. Get that thing out of there. And she didn't stop to think, uh-oh, what about the blood thinner? So at trial, we couldn't settle. We go to court and I give my opening statement to this federal jury. And I told them what she, the doctor will say that she said this in her deposition. And she will tell you later in the trial that there were too many epidural catheters and she didn't know it was in her patient, et cetera. And I sit down. Then her lawyer got up. Watch this now. He got up and said, it's true. The doctor said that in her deposition, but she made a mistake. Oh. She meant to say there were too many shoulder blocks being done for shoulder surgery. And she got that confused. And there never was a problem with epidural catheters. I went, oh. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> the smoke starts coming out of my ears. <laughs> that sounds kind of fishy. This is it? <laughs> so convenient. <laughs> I was so mad. I had an expert ready to go on the stand as my first witness. I told my associate, send that expert back to the hotel. I'm calling that doctor right there as our first expert. And we're going to get to the bottom of this. And Anyway, when he said that, I looked over at the doctor, the surgeon, and she looked down at the table. She couldn't look at me. And I called her as the first witness. I said, to state your name. Are you the doctor who operated on Betty Donaldson? Yes. I want you to look this jury in the eye, tell them, was there or wasn't there a problem with epidural catheters? 30 seconds, dead silence. She finally said, yes. And I said, we're not talking about shoulder blocks here, are we? No. Mm. We're talking about epidural catheters, aren't we? 
Yes. And the jury looked at that bank of lawyers for the defendants like, we're going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh man, the drama. Oh, well, that case was over in those first few seconds, but the, the trial lasted over a month. Mm -hmm. It was over in those first few seconds. And, sure. Uh, so they awarded Betty about five million for pain and suffering past and some pain and suffering for the future, her medical bills loss of enjoyment of life. She was in a wheelchair for life. And they, they awarded her husband, I think, two or $3 million for his, uh, his loss of consortium. Yeah, I see that. I think it was $3 million. So a question for you on the medical details, because our audience includes doctors and nurses and yeah. uh, lawyers on both sides. Was the, did the experts find that the error was putting, because I, I see that the surgeon um, was found liable or, you know, there was some of the issues that was, you know, the surgeon was found partially responsible for the outcome. So was the issue that the epidural catheter was put into a patient with, with who was on blood thinners, or was the issue that it was taken out of a patient without correcting the coagulation? Both. Or were they both issues? Both, both. Oh, so they were both then found liable, the, the anesthetist who inserted and then the doctor who ordered it taken out and that the nurse who took it out, correct? Exactly. You're, you're on this. Those are the issues. So she was not a proper candidate for an epidural catheter. Never should have been even, not if they considered it, they should have ruled it out, you know, and managed her post-op pain another way. But this was a popular thing to do at this hospital. And people need to think that I'd suggest that the lesson for medical care providers is don't get locked into one policy and procedure every time. Each patient deserves to have his or her history, condition considered carefully. And that's, uh, of course, what they should do. And the standard of care is to do that and not just keep doing what we always do routinely. And then you have to think, once you figure out the surgeon was found liable for not pausing and thinking, what are the consequences? Could, could my order be misunderstood? Uh, she testified, I meant pull it in accordance with the proper protocol. Mm. The nurse interpreted it to mean, get that out now. Yeah, and We can't reproduce the humanity of that moment when, when the doctor said it, but I suspect she was mad that another one of these was, was in her patients. And so she said, get that thing out. You know, probably in the nurse went, oh gosh, we got to get that thing out right now. <laughs> that's how things go sometimes in the that's hospital. How, that's how these <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, and you know, you know, what I find it really interesting here is that I have no doubt that if you ask every single one of these individuals, um, from the anesthetist to the surgeon to the nurse, every one of them would have been able to say that a epidural catheter is contraindicated in someone who's on blood thinners. Everyone would know that, or the blood or the blood coagulation has to be corrected before you insert it and or remove it. So, what do you think? And this is so common in malpractice cases where I think the knowledge is there. But I don't know if it's the communication or the critical thinking is missing or just what you just simply said, just someone taking the time to look at the history and or fully express what they meant to say, not take it out, but take it out according to protocol, as you said, the doctor may have said. So what do you feel, um, you know, as a lawyer, and you would have known every single inside detail of this case, I have no doubt by the time you went to trial with that jury in a federal court, what do you think is behind errors like this um, that lead to malpractice cases? As an outsider, what do you think? I, I think, you know, they have a job to do, serious work. And I think sometimes uh, other things are going on in people's lives, medical care providers' lives, that can be distracting. Somebody can be in a hurry. 
somebody can be thinking about something else and they don't stop and think. You know, a lot of these people are so busy. Lord, my wife had her, uh, her knee replaced in uh, another city recently. And after that knee replacement, the surgeon comes by to talk to me, and he spent a total of 40 seconds with me headed to the next OR. So he's in a hurry, right? Sorry. He's going to knock out about eight of these operations that day. Now, he's making a fortune, but he needs to slow down a little bit, maybe one less patient or something. And, you know, whoa. But I just think people don't stop and really think carefully. And I have a suggestion for uh, any medical care provider listening. Uh, if you have direct patient care, if you would think of your patient as your mother or some other person who's very dear to you, when you talk to that person and get the history, think of it as your mother and you're going to listen very carefully. You're going to put everything else out of your mind and you're going to go, okay, tell me, for instance, mother, for instance, <laughs> what has happened? What has happened? Why do you feel this way? Where do you hurt? What's been going on? You know, do all those things that you're taught to do in medical school or nursing school, you're taught to do those things. And listen carefully. Don't jump to conclusions, but listen very carefully and get some working uh, differential going. And then order the right test, the appropriate test, not unreasonable test, but the right ones because you've listened carefully to the history. You uh, know a good idea, probably I, some people say 80% of the diagnosis is made are from the history, right? The history will give you the diagnosis so often. The patient will give it to you if, if you're listening. So then run those tests and, and then See, if it's your mother, you'd be thinking, now, I've got all this information. Do I need somebody to help me with this? Do I need a specialist, maybe? Should I consult? Should I get another opinion? And then you'll, you'll be on the road. The, the, the trouble comes when people are distracted, care providers are distracted and are not taking those necessary steps. Yeah, that's a really good point. And some really great advice to think about your patient, not just as a diagnosis or another person or another thing to do that day. And it's as a hard, shout out to it's hard to do that. You know, I know. I was just so gonna hard. say that as a it's shout so out to hard. care providers, acute care is so busy and so overwhelming. And you hit the nail on the head that nurses and doctors and everybody working in healthcare struggles with the same things that we all struggle with. Their mom had surgery last week and their dog's at the vet and their kids are sick and you know they didn't get any sleep last night. Those issues are as real for healthcare providers as they're going through a divorce. They're, they've had their own medical diagnosis. There's all sorts of things going on. But um, you know, the stakes are high in healthcare. I, I talk to nurses a lot about medical malpractice, and I think. I'm on the exact same page as you. Um, when I say, I know you're tired and I know this is hard and I know it can be overwhelming, but keep your eyes and ears open and stay diligent and stay curious, stay really curious wherever you can to not just think, not blow things off, not blow complaints off. When someone says that hurts or that burns and it's a new complaint, just dig a little bit and see what's going on. Because certainly in the cases I've seen, sometimes there's one person who kind of gets it and it does a little bit of investigation, but then shift change happens or handover of care happens and the issue gets dropped. And 24, 36, 48 hours later, we've got a very serious complication on our hands. And, um, you know, and I, there's always a moment, I think. There's a moment in all malpractice cases where you think right here is where something could have been said or done, or somebody could have been told, and this outcome could have been different. It could have gone a different direction. 
So this case I found really interesting about how, because I know that every single one of those healthcare professionals would have had it in their knowledge that an epidural catheter should not be inserted and or pulled out quickly in somebody who's on anticoagulation therapy. You know that, that's a given. That's a basic, that's a basic expected knowledge of all of them. So a fascinating case, I think. Um, again, congratulations. A, a quick question for you on this, like, and I, I've asked this to quite a few malpractice lawyers, how the heck do you keep up with the medicine here? <laughs> like, there's, there's so much to learn with every single case that you do. And I can tell listening to you that you learned what you needed to know for this case. How do you do it? Well, you just study in, you know, it's each case uh, is different and you have to get the books out and you have to talk to your experts and learn as much as you can. And then you your job becomes, okay, now you've got to convert all this knowledge into something the jury can understand and follow, you know, and that's one of the things that scares uh, the medical community is how in the world is a jury of non-professionals going to understand the complex medicine in this case. And sure. it scares, scares them. And I don't blame them for being scared of that, but in the end, uh, these cases become a battle between uh, experts, uh, a battle between experienced lawyers because brand new lawyers do not handle med medical malpractice cases, experienced ones do. And, eventually the jury is going to get it right. And by right, I mean that nationally 80% of the medical malpractice cases are won by the medical care providers. So that should be of some encouragement to the, to the medical people. And it's, it's uh, interesting uh, work. I love the, uh, like you said, I'm kind of curious about this and, it's uh, fun. I could probably do, uh, I could probably make a C as an ER doctor. <laughs> oh, <maybe. laughs> sure, take a careful hit. I can tell you that. Yeah, you <laughs> sure would. <laughs> I'd be listening. A, yeah, I think it's a tough job at this point in your life, though. A couple of 24 hour, 36 hour shifts, and you'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, this yeah, one's for me. Somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so two questions out of what you just said. Um, my business, Connect Medical Legal Experts, finds experts for lawyers, both plaintiff and defense lawyers and criminal lawyers, all kinds of Department of Justice. We have about 250 experts working every day. Um, I can tell by your history that you've worked with a lot of great medical experts for all the doctors and nurses listening who do expert witness work, tell us in your view, what makes a really valuable healthcare expert? That's a great question. And number one, you have to think about where you're going to try your case. And uh, you think about the jury panel that you're going to have. And then what type of person would fit there? Now, Usually, experts from all over the country are okay uh, for any, any other place because a, a juror is going to see superficial things at first about an expert. Let's say you're in southern Alabama with a case and somebody from New York comes in with a, with a so-called New York accent. <laughs> Initially, that is going to uh, not go over so well with the Southern Alabama jury. But fear not if you're in the Northeast and someone wants to employ you as an expert in the South. The jury will get past that if you know what you're talking about and you, you, your opinions are good and you're, you're testifying in, in the truth. And they'll... Not do, one of my greatest experts was from uh, in Tennessee. I used was from Long Island, and had that big accent. Well, I love that guy, and uh, we just we'd made a good team. And he'd come down here, and I'll never forget a defense lawyer in a medical malpractice case saying to uh, 
Dr. Peter Lichtenfeld from Long Island. He was a neurologist, and, and my opponent said, Doctor, in, in front of the jury, Doctor, why did Mr. Kennard go past thousands of other neurologists between Nashville and Long Island and get you? He said, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Then he said, uh, well, maybe it was because uh, he read an article I, I wrote. Or maybe it was uh, a textbook I helped publish. Or maybe there's these other things. But anyway, it, it, uh, the jury was just giggling, and they didn't care. But what makes a good expert is uh, a person who knows what they're talking about. If there is a uh, medical care provider on trial who is a surgeon, a general surgeon. That doctor wants a general surgeon like him to testify for him. And the plaintiff bringing the case wants a general surgeon like the defendant to testify. You don't want a non specialist, you know, somebody not like the defendant to carry the load for the patient. Now you can have the so-called academic expert who is at the academic institution, but most of those people also do a lot of clinical work, a lot of surgery, and they can add things that the general surgeon just out in the field, like the defendant can't add. They can put a little different uh, slant to the case. Uh, same thing with nurses. You, you, you want a nurse from the field like that nurse. I see you. You want an ICU nurse. And mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, and who can kind of speak a language the jury can follow. Okay. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> and I think most, well, I think all nurses and many doctors can do that. They can translate very complex medical information into language that their patients can understand. Talk to me just for a sec about judge trial or jury trial, because um, it's everything you've mentioned so far has been jury. Uh, is that a choice you make? And what is your preference between a judge and a jury trial? Or how does that get decided, whether it's a judge or jury trial in Tennessee? Okay, uh, this is true across the country, but in, in Tennessee, if either side, quote, demands, quote, a jury, then the jury is the answer. I don't even ask for a jury. I'd be happy for any judge to try any of my cases. I'd be happy to do it. It's the defendant who wants the jury. Interestingly. Why is that? <laughs> well, because Tennessee, you have to have 12 jurors agree. Some states, you only need a majority. Can you imagine running for office and having them win 100% of the votes to be elected? No. Well, that's what you have to do in Tennessee as, a, as the patient. So all of them uh, have to agree on the verdict. So one juror can, quote, hang up a jury in Tennessee. You could have mm. votes for the patient, one for the doctor, and that one refuses to budge. The case is over, has to be retried. Also, suppose uh, 11 jurors agree $10 million would be fair, and one is going, you're insane. You're all, all 11 of you are crazy, and I'll go along with two but nothing else. And then that one person can bring down the others to say six and sort of what we call mitigate the verdict. And the, these are the reasons why the defense wants a jury in Tennessee. Hmm. So are most of your trials in front of a jury? Yes, except there's no federal case against the government. Right to a jury, you know, mm. <laughs> the government does not trust juries ruling against the government, right? So they, mm. they all that only a United States district 
federal judge can hear a case against the government for medical malpractice. Oh, I see. I see. Interesting. Um, I want to take just one step back to the um, Betty Donathan case. And this is for all the lawyers and attorneys who might be listening. I, I found, I mentioned that I found this cross-examination of an orthopedic surgeon by you on the internet. And it's quite a fascinating read. And um, I found it interesting because it gives you some really nice kudos to how you handled it, but also has some suggestions for how things could have been done a little bit differently, or you could have gone a little bit down a different road. Um, but it was, I just thought any like lawyers and attorneys love this kind of stuff. I've read, you know, cross examination um, <clears throat> examples like this in many places. So I'm, I'm not sure what publication this is from, but the title of the document is Randy Kennard cross examination of an orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon expert witness on standard of care issues. On the case, Donathan V, the Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Clinic. So if you're interested in looking that up, um, have a look for it on the internet or get in touch with me, crokosh at connectmlx.com, and I'll send a copy of that to you for any of the lawyers or attorneys listening that want a copy of that. So let's shift gears just a little bit. Um, I was interested in your your Vietnam War experience as a young man. And I see a picture over your right shoulder there of General George Patton. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> Talk to us a little bit about how, and you mentioned on your website that that helped prepare you for your life as an attorney. Talk to us a little bit about how your Vietnam experience has affected, influenced, and um, prepared you for life as an attorney. Well, first of all, it's made me grateful to be alive, you know. Oh, yes. So I, I'm so grateful to be alive. It was so close. So many times I could have died. And uh, so I'm just grateful that I was allowed to do something for other people and help people in my profession and outside my profession to do volunteer work and that kind of thing. It's just, uh, well, it's wonderful to be alive. Okay. And so, but how professionally in law did that experience help me? I think, uh, you know, I remember being a very young man and getting on a helicopter to go to a landing zone in the combat hot place and wondering who among us is going to die today. Who's going to be wounded and changed forever. And will I be one of those people? It's a very scary thing. As you can imagine, you lifting off and you know, this could be it. So now when I go to court, I think a lot about that, past experience. And I think nobody's going to die. Nobody's <laughs> going to hurt. I mean, and, and the fear I would have going into a hot LZ is not there. Mm -hmm. I have apprehension. I guess you could call it fear. Uh, I've learned to deal with that sort of apprehension a lot better as a result of Vietnam. And, uh, you know, it's just, nobody's going to die. And if you lose Randy, you've done the best you can. You did the best you could for your client and the jury disagreed with, uh, your side of the case, but life is not going to end. And so that's helped a lot. Another thing I learned, of course, I studied, military art a lot. And my favorite all time military instructor was Sun Tzu, S-U-N-T-Z-U, -T -T a Chinese warrior about 2,500 years ago. It's a great book out of uh, the art of war by him that people may want to get no matter what profession you're in. Uh, it's very interesting, but for lawyers, it would be particularly helpful. But one of Sun Tzu's teaching was when your army is near the enemy, 
make it appear you're far away. When you're far away, make your enemy think you are near. And another principle he had was strike like a thunderbolt. Move fast, hit hard, and shock the enemy. Mm -hmm. So I had do a lot of preparation for trial on how am I going to surprise the other side because of the value of surprise. And people think on both sides of uh, these cases that, oh, there are no surprises in court because of the fancy discovery we have. We get to discover everything, interrogatories and depositions of everybody, depositions of experts, and there's no way to surprise anybody. And that's not true. And I, I work very hard to find ways to uh, be what I'll call unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And being unpredictable is an asset. So that's uh, kind of it, Chris, on uh, Vietnam. I can go on forever about Vietnam. Now. Otherwise, yeah, <clears throat> I'm sure you got, could, but uh, two things that, that I want to just comment on that. I mean, congratulations on coming that out of that experience, not afraid um, of things that aren't truly frightening, because I think some people are so damaged by that experience that they live their life afraid. And um, I connect with on a whole different level and nothing as serious as yours, but with my nursing background, my kids will tell you that they had to be pretty much bleeding out of their mouth and on the floor before I would pay any attention to them because I know death and danger when I see yes. it. And that's <laughs> not it, right? That's serious. not it. Mama, you're not taking me seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I've got some tough kids because of that. But the other thing I just want to comment on your element of surprise that you just um alluded to there in this cross-examination, which I read twice yesterday, I was so fascinated by it. There's two times in here we, where the, um, the person commenting talks about your element of surprise. And, you know, in this case with Betty Donathan, Easter Sunday was an issue. And you very quickly and early in the cross-examination went to the fact that you were in Vietnam and Easter Sunday was not a day any different from any other day. You still had a job to do just like you did on, on you know, the Thursday before that week. And then you wrapped it up like quick, like you're going somewhere and you're going somewhere. And then you pop one question about the epidural catheter and boom, it's over. And um, so I can see that you've really nicely and beautifully adapted that element of surprise in your cross-examination. And it worked it worked very well. It worked very well in that case. So I think we should, um, I feel like we could probably talk for days, but we've been talking for a lovely hour. And I'd still like to, to do another short podcast with you a little bit more personal about you. You, Randall, as a canard, as a man and a person um, outside of your attorney work. But I would like to ask you, because our audience include, includes attorneys and healthcare professionals in the general public, I'd like to ask you this question for each audience before we just wrap up. I think, and the question is, what is the most important thing that you would like them to know about malpractice? You may, you may feel that you've answered this for healthcare providers. You gave a lovely bit of advice there about you know, paying attention, not ignoring, taking a second. But um, let me ask you in three different questions. For the attorneys listening in, um, what is the most important thing that you'd like them to know about medical malpractice? Well, it's real. Mm -hmm. When I first started practicing law, uh, I held doctors, nurses, and anybody in the health care community on a pedestal. I think it was part of my background to always do that. And I still do. I still do. And even if a provider has made a mistake in one case, that doesn't mean I don't hold that person on a pedestal, but I, I still do. When I see my doctor, he's on a pedestal. And when the nurse comes in, she's on a pedestal. But I learned early in, in my law career when a case was referred to me, 
and somebody asked me to represent a federal prisoner in a medical malpractice claim against the government. I said, I don't do that. And they said, well, would you at least go talk to the, to the man? So I went out to the prison and uh, talked to him and he told me what happened. And he said he needed a hemorrhoidectomy and the government doctor who did the surgery had a condition that uh, he la- the, the man later found out was Huntington's chorea, mm-hmm. causing him to shake a lot and that he cut his anus really badly during this procedure. And then he had no bowel control uh, and had to wear diapers the rest of his life. Oh, boy. I went, my goodness. And so I said, well, I'll take your case. And I took that doctor's deposition and his hands were shaking. It wasn't just from being nervous about the deposition. And I said, do you have Huntington's Korea? He said, yes. I said, how long have you had it? And he told me several years. And so I thought, you just should not be doing that type of surgery anymore. And that showed me that uh, that interview with, with that client caused me to go forward. And my practice is real. I learned that. So it, it does exist. And in cases where there has been malpractice, the patient is entitled to a recovery, a fair and just re- recovery. And if, if the case can't be settled by the medical care provider and the insurance company, then they should go forward, have no fear, and uh, go, go in there and uh, represent the patient. If the medical care provider has done something wrong, consider allowing the insurance company to pay the patient. So does that answer your question, Chris? It does answer my question. The specific question was, what do you want, what do you want attorneys to know about malpractice? And your answer was, it's real. It's real. It's real. It, there was a recent Johns Hopkins study that said uh, we estimate there are 250,000 deaths a year due to medical errors. And medical malpractice is the third leading cause of death in the United States behind the heart disease and cancer. That's a pretty significant number of people. Other studies suggest it's more than that, 440,000, one study suggested. That is a lot of unnecessary loss of life, preventable, shouldn't happen. A lot of families who are just uh, so devastated. So it's real, and uh, but this is a tough, tough area to get into. It, it, it takes some tenacity and uh, ability to fight hard and to stand up when you lose. You know, you get knocked down. You'll get knocked down in this business on either side. You have to get back up and get in there. And yeah. So. All right. Well, that's a really nice piece of advice. And we talked about healthcare providers. So since we talked about the statistically, the incredible number of malpractice cases or errors that happen, um, what's the most important thing you'd like the public to know about medical malpractice? My mom just had uh, broke a hip and had surgery a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I didn't leave her side for several days. I was there all day, every day, uh, just, you know, (laughs) keeping an eye on things um, from my nursing perspective. But you as a malpractice attorney, what do you want the public to know about malpractice? Well, Chris, you hit it right on the head. Um, If a loved one or you or somebody is going into the hospital, Have somebody with you you trust to sit there and keep an eye on things and ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You'll be worried, well, am I going to become a nuisance? And there's a line you don't want to go over. You don't want to become a nuisance, but uh, proper questions are appropriate. I remember, boy, if it wasn't for my wife, 
I, I could have died. I was in the hospital with a ruptured appendix. Mm -hmm. I had surgery. And I had tubes coming out of my body every which way. You can imagine the number of tubes I had. And they opened me up, you know, it was not laparoscopic. And so the first night I'm going down the hall, but I know about uh, blood clots in the legs from not walking, you know, so I'm up. Midnight, I was up going down the hall with that crazy carrier, all these containers. <laughs> <laughs> It took two nurses to walk me down the hall, a half a lap, and I came back. It was a lot of trouble. And I was up again at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and the next night, the word's out on Canard. He likes to walk. <laughs> Brace yourself. He's a, he's a lot of trouble, that guy. He's a lot of, this guy is a lot of trouble. He's trying to keep from dying from a blood clot. <laughs> oh, so this nurse, sadly, I didn't, I didn't know she was doing it. She, she gives me a sedative mm -hmm. uh, or I forget, maybe it was Xanax. I'm not sure what it was, whatever it was, I was allergic to it. And she wanted me to go to sleep. Right. Yeah. Right. It was on my <laughs> allergies of medicine. <laughs> oh, no. Now I was in a hospital where it was a uh, Catholic based and in every room, there's a cross with Jesus on the cross, okay? And I'm in bed, and it's pitch black, and my wife is in the recliner next to me. Now, I have forgotten all of this. I'm now hallucinating big time. I wake up, and all I can see is a white light under the door. It's all I can see at, when I first wake up. And I'm hallucinating so bad. I think, I think I'm in some sort of jail or some other laboratory where they're doing an experiment on me. And I feel all these tubes and everything. Mm -hmm. And all I can think was, I've got to rip these things out and get out of here. They're trying to kill me. They're going to kill me. In here. <laughs> and then there was enough. I could see Jesus on, on the wall. And he came off the cross and started flying around the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Yeah. It must have been terrifying for you. Well, from one place to the other. And I go oh. out of here. And finally, I noticed my wife, whose back was to me, she was in a recliner. She was had her back to me and she was asleep, exhausted. And I had enough presence to say, Peggy, where yeah. happened? She said, Randy, you're in a hospital. What for? What for? She said, You've had surgery. <laughs> These two, I mean, she said, well, uh, they're there because the doctor's been mm -hmm. there. You have to keep them there. I said, oh, okay. So I calmed down. The point being, had she not been there, I got right. it. That's what would have happened. I mean, right. <laughs> it would have been a sight. Yeah. And I'll so, tell you what would have happened. You'd have yanked out all those tubes and gotten out of bed, and the nurses would have found you out in the hallway in a mess. <laughs> like that's what <laughs> that's what happens in that situation sometimes. Have you seen it happen, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. You wake up and you're disoriented and afraid, and you know, hallucinating and drugged, and that's what happens right there. You'd have ripped out every tube and started charging out of there just to get away from the flying Jesus, if nothing. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> well, I would suggest oh. also to the public, if you know, if you're not in the hospital, so if you're in the hospital, have somebody with you if you can that you trust uh, to help. Just keep an eye on things and who can help you. Yeah. We're going to the doctor's office. It's and this is particularly true for people who are moving on in age a little bit. It's good to have a spouse with you or uh, and in the case of my elderly father, a few years ago, before he passed, I went to a general surgeon's office. So because he had a, an abdominal aorta aneurysm. And we, I know we're going to discuss the pros and cons of possible surgery. And I also knew my father is not likely to remember much of this or understand it. And, I, and I'm going to go and, and listen. And if it's appropriate, I'm going to say something. So the surgeon uh, explains 
at the time, this was a, oh, the morbidity from this was big, you know, can be the mortality was significant. Yeah. That's serious stuff. And he said to my father, uh, if you don't do this surgery, what will happen in about five years or so, this is going to burst and you're going to bleed to death. It'll take a few minutes and you'll die. If you do have the surgery, uh, you may wish you were dead, <laughs> you know? And my father just had this perplexed look on his face and he said, Randy, what should I do? Talk mm -hmm. about burden, right? Really? Said, yeah. don't, don't do the surgery, dad. He said, okay. And indeed he died three years later of, of another problem. And that decision was right, but uh, there's no telling what he would have decided if I hadn't been there, you know, he, he, the type of guy who'd always listened to the doctor. And if that doctor had said, I want to do the surgery, he probably would have gone along with it. And then who knows what would have happened. But so it's good to have somebody with you is the main thing. And don't be afraid to get another opinion. If you feel not so sure about what you just heard. That's right. So to lawyers, you're to attorneys, you're saying malpractice is real to healthcare providers. You're saying, pay attention, you know, just take a second and to the public have an advocate for you whenever you can have a second pair of eyes and ears for you. That's some really good advice all the way around. Yes. Well, Randy, I think with that, we'll wrap up this portion of the podcast. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. This has just felt like an easy conversation <clears throat> between a couple of friends, and I've enjoyed every single second of it. I feel like we could probably talk for a day and a half if we had a day and a half. Um, but let's, um, let's uh, call this one done, because I would like to come back and do a shorter podcast more specifically about you if you've got the time to do it. So thank you so much for being here with us today. It's greatly appreciated. It's been my pleasure. Your questions were so good. And uh, I enjoyed the conversation also, Chris. Thank you. What, Excellent. What a, what a good thing you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.